Okay. Well, why don't we kick it off? We have a lot to cover today. Um, thank you all for joining us. I'm Mirinder. I'm the executive lead of New Power Labs. Um, many of you may know us, but MPL is a think tank, do tank. Our work is about moving capital to underfunded and overlooked communities. And this work spans the diversity of Canada. So when we think about the, the, the depth of diver diversity in our country from gender, ethnicity, abilities, sexual orientation, language, and more. And we also work across the capital spectrum from philanthropy to impact investing, to venture capital, to traditional finance with a goal of flowing capital and supporting those who deploy capital, um, getting it into the hands of communities that have been underfunded and overlooked. Uh, we have a growing group of partners in New Power Lab. Some like Keith and Duca Impact Lab have been here since day zero as a founding partner. Uh, these founding partners include Duca Impact Labs, West, Coast Capital, OTF, Community Foundations of Canada. And we're really excited to announce more soon. Uh, we've also had support um, from the federal government to do a deeper dive into social finance and impact investing. So thrilled to have just a great group of individuals alongside uh, working alongside us in a shared vision of, of, of shifting capital to communities and to leaders that are underrepresented. So many of us today join in the virtual panel. Uh, we live, work, and play on the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Neshobi, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people who have stewarded this land for thousands of years. And today we're going to go deep into predatory lending to the underserved. This topic is particularly close to me. I've worked in microfinance for many years, both in Canada and West Africa. Um, you know, the goal was always to create access to capital to the under and unbanked. Um, and this work included when I was 28 years old, uh, building a, a local micro fund here in Canada called RISE, um, which is uh, which provides capital and mentorship to people with a history of mental health and addiction challenges. And this was in partnership with Joe Rotman, uh, Rotman and Kim H. Um, it was through this experience and others that I became very versed with the predatory lending practices that exist across Canada and beyond our borders. Um, and also some of the predatory saving uh, uh, products that are out there. And we may or may not get into that today, but, but um, it's really just an interesting deep dive of of things we, we might not have top of mind, but affect those um, that have the least access to banking. So today we're thrilled to be joined by two amazing leaders, Keith and Jonah. Um, and we know that there's a tremendous number of individuals uh, who are joining us today and we'd love to get to know you. So please introduce yourself in the chat. And just a quick note on housekeeping, the session will be recorded. Um, the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, to turn close, to turn on closed caption, please click on the CC icon you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and we'll also be having a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. Please uh, put your questions into the Q&A box um, and you can also vote for questions if you like um, and put them in as you have them. So I'll see if I can try to tackle and embed those into the conversation as well. Okay. So now to our panelists, I want to introduce Keith Taylor, who's the executive director of Duca Impact Lab. Keith um, is um, ED of Duca Impact Labs, which is a social finance innovation hub founded by Duca Credit Union. The Impact Lab works as a lever for leveraging emerging technology and community-based insights to build banking models that benefit all members of the community. During his career at Duca, he has led the development of Canada's first social purpose mortgage product, the emergence of Duca as Toronto's first living wage employer, and the certification of Duca as the first B Corp credit union in the world. Keith is also a co-founding member of New Power Labs. Uh, welcome, Keith. And, Thanks. And we have Jonah Cheninga, who is a co-founder and CEO of Wovio which is a groundbreaking community wallet for rotating savings and credit building. With a keen interest in alternative financing, Jonah has been accredited by the World Bank in his expertise in this field. And he's widely respected for his innovative approach to financial inclusion and community-based business solutions. 
In addition to his work with Wolio, jo Jonah sits as an active member of the entrepreneurial community and sits on the board of the Startup Zone, a business incubator that helps early stage startups grow and succeed. Welcome, Jonah. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna kick it off with a poll question. So you'll see this on your screen. According to the State of Fair Banking report in 2021, what was the percentage of borrowers that had fallen behind on loan payments in the last year? See, this is where we need the Jeopardy music. Next time. Okay, do we have everyone's vote in? Okay, so folks thought 40%. Now, here's the good news. It's 16%. Um, now, the bad news, it's still one in six um, borrowers. So it, it's still there, but, but we'll, we'll get into some of the work and insights from this report as well during our conversation. Okay, so with that, um, Keith, you are the executive lead of Duca Impact Lab, which was created by Duca Credit Union. I think folks are familiar with ways in which we can have an impact as a financial institution. So creating fair practices for employees, investing in sustainability. Um, but the Impact Lab takes a step further by thinking not only about your internal culture or minimizing your footprint, but actually creating products for the underbank. Can you share a bit more about the Impact Lab, why it was established, and how you developed the credibility with communities that you work in? Sure. Uh, so the Impact Lab, um, was was born out of uh, Duca Credit Union. And the credit union has a really interesting history, which I'll, I'll go into a little bit. But just to give you kind of my, you know, my take on my tenure at the, at the credit union, I, I came on board because Duca has been around for about 70 years. Uh, it was a fast growing credit union. I think in the time I've been there, it's been one of the fastest growing credit unions in, in Canada. And what was compelling about that is a couple of things. Uh, one is that you, you, it, it's it's banking is one of those things that's difficult to go through life and not interact with. It's it's kind of like healthcare in a way. Like you can't you live your life without interacting with the healthcare system. You can't interact live your life without interacting with the banking system in some way, shape, or form. So that creates a, a really excellent platform for for having an influence on people's lives if you if you if you do it right. Uh, and Duca, what was compelling to me about Duca was that it was. Uh, a company that clearly had a history of, you know, wanting to be a good corporate citizen, wanting to have a social impact. Um, but there was an opportunity there for something more. Uh, so in the early years, that kind of took the shape, like you mentioned, the B Corp certification, uh, the living wage uh, work, um, some of the products we developed. And, and within that, we realized that there was a real um, thread emerging and that we could leverage our business models for having a really important social impact. It was a really great vehicle for uh, having an impact on people's lives, for improving people's circumstances and, and helping them do things uh, that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. Uh, and that was the mission of the credit union to help people do more, be more and, uh, and achieve more. So that recognized, uh, we also had kind of a, a reflective moment on our, our history as a credit union, which was that you know, 70 years ago, we were formed by a group of newcomers to Canada uh, that the banks didn't want to deal with. Uh, and they didn't want to deal with them for uh, a number of reasons, but the primary ones were that they didn't have established Canadian credit histories. Uh, and at the time, they weren't sending the right signals to the banks that they'd be good banking customers. Uh, and what's interesting about our story over the last 70 years is like, not only were that those uh, folks that founded the credit union uh, good banking customers, they turned out to be excellent banking customers. So I think if you analyze our growth rate for 70 straight years, it's in the double digits, particularly important as a business growth story because we, we don't have access to public markets. We had to finance, we got to almost have to self-finance through the members of the, of the credit union. So here's a great example of people who are on paper not supposed to be very good banking customers, turned out to be excellent banking customers uh, and produced a really thriving institution for a long period of time and continues to thrive into, into the future. So with that realization, we kind of said, well, huh, if the signals that they were using to send to the banks uh, were, were painting them as kind of imperfect candidates uh, or, or, or kind of people that we, we didn't want to deal with as an institution then, you know, what does that look like now? 
because uh, I think what that that history tells us is that that group of individuals uh, was quite worthy of, of being banking. And, and it's more than just a business growth story. It's a story about how we use those signals to determine access and how those signals are really imperfect. And if they're imperfect then, 70 years ago, they're imperfect now. So how do we create some space to come up with some better signals and some better models of lending uh, and prove how those models work? And that's what the Impact Lab was designed to do. So we created an entity uh, outside of the credit union, actually. It's structured as a, a nonprofit innovation hub, mainly for the reason that we didn't want the innovation work that's happening in the Impact Lab to be driven by earning you know, uh, a certain hurdle rate three months at a time. We didn't want it to be profit focused. We want it to be value focused. So what value are we creating? Uh, yes, through the financial viability of the innovations we're producing, but also the value that we're creating for our borrowers and the people and the stakeholders that are involved in our, in our business models. So that's what the Impact Lab is. It was set up to, uh, really with just two things in mind. Uh, what would banking look like if all we were trying to do uh, was create an opportunity or solve a problem? So the primary goal of the work, we, the innovation work we do in the, in the Impact Lab is to use community-based insight to come up with models of lending that address an inequity um, uh, issue in the banking system, design a model of, of lending to address that inequity and establish what the risk of that type of lending is so that it can be scaled either in, in the institution or in its own right uh, as a standalone uh, vehicle. So that's the impact, that's the impact lab. Uh, we're going to get into a great example of one of those innovations that we work on called the escalator loan. Uh, but with, you know, having said all that, I think uh, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Jonah. Right. And maybe I'll just, I'll add a little context. So yeah, the, I think the Escalator Lab addresses predatory lending. And I know Jonah, you co-founded co Wovio, uh, which is a community wallet for rotating savings and credit um, as an alternative to predatory lending to communities have been that have and continue to be limited to banking services. Can you share a bit more about Wovio and the story behind your product? Yeah, no, happy, happy to do that. And uh, thanks for having me. Um, so we started Wovio from lived experiences as immigrants to Canada. So I came to Canada in 2014, and it took me six years before I could access a line of credit for my bank. And uh, this was incredibly frustrating uh, as I was left exposed to predatory products and credit cards as my alternative solution. Um, so having gone through that problem, we wanted to find an alternative solution. And um, after some years, I had uh, did some work with the World Bank, where we're looking at the intersection of immigration and financial inclusion in North America, uh, because we're having our demographics are changing. We're having a lot of immigrants coming to Canada, but it takes three to five years to be able to establish a solid credit history to be able to gain access to affordable financial services. Um, so with what with Wovio, what we did is adopted a century old model that is practiced around the globe called rotating savings. Uh, this model is known across different cultures. Uh, from uh, in India, they know them as chit funds. In Nigeria, they know them as susus. In China, they know them as hui. So where these immigrants are coming from, this is a popular model for them in terms of banking and uh, providing access to affordable financial services. Um, so for us, it was how do we use technology uh, to be able to enable them to facilitate this transaction in a way that enables them to build credit history. Um, so that what that's what we have done. So we've built a community wallet whereby these communities can pull funds together and utilize it as a financial security mechanism. And in that process, we have partnered with Equifax to be able to report those transactions and enable them to build credit history in a way that has never been done before. Our mission as a company is to give uh, newcomers financial security, which they don't have. Uh, so that's kind of like what we are focused on in terms of leveraging technology for decentralizing access to credit. Amazing. And then for folks who remember uh, Lise, uh, who is one of the partners at BKR, um, you are also an investee of BKR. So it's uh, yeah. so it's great to see some early stage Canadian venture capital going into a product like yours. Um, okay, so so when we think about then Canada, I think you both shared some similarities in terms of you know how immigrants um, we we just not. I'd use the word fail, but we've not done an effective job on, in, at scale in enabling uh, newcomers and immigrants to be able to access um, capital. 
um, in, in when, you know, I always think about the opportunity for us as a country and the economic opportunity for us at a, as a country and what we're leaving behind by not solving this. So it's great to hear kind of both, um, both the work of Duca Impact Labs, Duca Broadly, and Lovio. So in Canada, we're also experiencing a dramatic rise of cost living. Uh, we know some of the most vulnerable populations are um, being impacted the most through this. Uh, I know Duca did a study on gaps in perceived fairness in banking um, and the impact of debt. I'm wondering if you can keep dig into that a bit more. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so as Narendra was uh, saying, uh, in addition to the pilot work that we run, we, so we design pilots and we test them with, uh, you know, technology and community partners uh, and Equifax as well, actually. Uh, and in, in addition to that, we've done some research on the state of fair banking in Canada. So it examines perceptions of fairness amongst people working in financial institutions uh, and perceptions of fairness amongst people that are are customers of financial institutions and looks at the gaps between those two groups uh, as an exploratory exercise of, you know, where is the banking system, uh, you know, leaving some value behind from a, a fairness perspective. Uh, so what we see, and I think what jumps to mind when I was listening to uh, your question was like, the one of the themes that comes out in that piece of work for me is that we have what is essentially an advice crisis in, in Canada, uh, and it spans all groups. Uh, so consumers feel that they're not getting, that the, 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 their financial institutions aren't credible advisors or able to advise them with their best interests in mind. Uh, people working in financial institutions also recognize it in a different way in that, that, you know, they recognize that people are buying financial products without actually listening to the advice and not understanding the implications of what uh, what they're taking on from a financial perspective. So there's some sort of disconnect there from a fairness perspective. And the reason I raise that, this advice crisis has implications that reach across the board. Uh, you know, we see it happening uh, with, you know, segments of the population that financial institutions are really bending over backwards to deal with. So it's not just people that are precarious. We see people that are, you know, high income, young, you know, well-earning, uh, you know, with some asset bases. These are these are generally relationships that financial institutions want to form. What we see even in that segment is that people are meeting with their financial advisors and then basically half of them are saying, I never want to interact with that institution again. So that's the people that we want to be dealing with or are really trying hard to be dealing with. And then there's people that really don't show up on credit, for your credit books uh, for mainstream financial institutions. And this advice crisis for, for that group, you know, has an impact on trust, which is actually really important when we start to talk about, okay, well, where are people going to get their financial needs addressed? Um, we see it uh, have particular influence on, on those that are, you know, in some sort of precarious situation, uh, whether they're uh, lower income individuals, whether there are people that are in, already in trouble with predatory debt or at risk of going that route because they don't want to talk to their institution about uh, solutions they could they could provide. Uh, so it's an important issue, and it's all in my mind. A lot of it is linked to the quality of advice and the the relationship that that enables. Uh, uh, and, and it's but it's rooted in in that advice piece, and we see. That I think one of the most telling examples of that is, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to use the data we we've kind of gotten from the you know feedback from the Black community in particular, where this is really a salient issue. That's a, it's a group of um, of group of consumers in Canada that are four times likelier to engage in predatory lending uh, in in the first place. But we also, when you you dig into that a little bit more, you see they're probably the, the least likely uh, racial segment to uh, feel like they have their finances under control or feel satisfied with how they're managing their finances. They're also the least likely segment to feel like they have access to mainstream financial services and, and the least likely segment to approach their mainstream financial institution for help. Um, and that impacts things like the types of debt they have, how much they pay for that debt, um, uh, you know, whether they're able to buy a house or it's kind of like the, the lowest access to, to mortgage uh, lending. Um, 
there's lowest access to low cost debt options like secured lines of credit and things like that. So we're getting into kind of banking technicalities, but I think that's where the rubber hits the road uh, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and a lot of it has to do with that they don't trust the mainstream financial institutions to help them and that they're shopping around to all these places, some of which are, are okay, and then some of which are, are extremely expensive uh, and set up to really uh, push high cost credit on, on people uh, and trap them in a, in a cycle. Thank you, Keith, for sharing that. And maybe jumping off that, Jonah, um, you mentioned that newcomers to Canada have often experienced barriers to banking. Can you talk more about this? Yeah, no, so in terms of our newcomers, um, this is uh, 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 a rising demographic in Canada. Um, so for example, last year in 2022, 95% of our population growth in Canada out of 1.5 million, one, uh, 1 million people was all immigrants coming to Canada. And when you look at this demographic, it takes three to five years to be able to establish credit history, uh, mainly one, because their financial history is not transferable. Uh, so they usually have to start from scratch. And then also two, there's a documentation component. Um, so are you a permanent resident or are you a temporary resident? That all combines into kind of like the risk models um, that go into our banking infrastructure. So when you look at those problems, uh, that's leaving many immigrants exposed to predatory products. Um, there's also financial gaps around culturally relevant products. Um, so usually when you come to Canada, you're given, let's say, a credit card, but then how does that credit card work? Uh, we do also have different demographics, such as our uh, people who practice Islamic banking, whereby it's a non-interest banking model. So how are we engaging all those uh, different uh, demographics? So when you look at all these issues, then we have kind of like, and we have a homogeneous banking uh, system here in Canada, is what alternatives can we use to be able to integrate uh, newcomers to Canada in a much easier uh, and cost-efficient way? And then that's when we look at systems, alternative systems, such as rotating savings as a mechanism to be able to bridge that gap. Um, so that's really kind of like one thing that we're focusing on, how do we enable newcomers uh, to be able to inter integrate into our banking system in a much more efficient way, because they are the next... Um, demographic that's growing in Canada, they're building different communities across Canada, and then how can we bridge that gap? So that's kind of like mainly our core focus of bridging that gap, taking the community and informal transactions, uh, and then making it as an on-ramp to credit visibility for most immigrants coming to Canada. Great, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's shocking when you look at both and the stats, Keith, you provided and Jonah, you provided. Um, also then kind of linking that to the opportunity we have to address kind of these large gaps we see in access to finance. And uh, maybe that's a good segue in, in Keith sharing more information about the escalator loan that Duke Impact Labs has launched. Um, what are you trying to address? What makes it dif different than a traditional loan? How does it help kind of solve um, and address this challenge? Yeah, so one of the, um, one of the pieces of, uh, well, one of the insights that came from that research work is that um, there was a sizable segment, uh, even if you just look at it at a really broad basis, uh, based on just overall credit score distribution, there's a sizable chunk of Canadians just not showing up on mainstream financial, uh, you know, credit portfolios uh, in a mainstream institution. And the way the pilots work at, uh, so we thought there was an opportunity there. We got into kind of a, a consultation with uh, a series of, of our partners and, and folks in our network that were doing work in this space. So it'd be like, you know, financial counselors, uh, different nonprofits, uh, different types of nonprofits, uh, some technology companies. Uh, you know, we, we got consistent feedback from, you know, a pretty broad range of, of organizations that, and we see, and we saw it in our own experience as a credit union that you know people are falling into traps of predatory lending, and sometimes that looks like payday loans. Sometimes it looks like something else. I, I, th I think payday loans is traditionally what we we focus on, um, but th there's different types of online lenders that I would describe as private, uh, private uh, predatory. There's private lenders. Uh, that are are generally off the radar, but can be quite predatory in their own right. Uh, there's different participants in the financial system that are are essentially trying to pick up that slack that's left by mainstream institutions, uh, and it's creating a situation where people are are stuck. Uh, so what we've decided to create, and we've been running a, a test on for the last uh, couple of years, is something called the escalator loan. 
which is not a payday loans alternative. I wouldn't describe it as that because payday loans alternatives are about quick money. It's about replicating the payday loan model just at a lower cost. That's not what we do. We, it's more similar to a consolidation loan where we are looking at the predatory debts that individuals have uh, and giving them a way out of that situation. So we're providing an influx of cash to consolidate all those predatory debts uh, under a much more favorable structure and enable them to move forward with their financial lives and, and start to build some assets and reduce their interest expense and, and really move on in a, in a number of ways. So the, the escalator loan is, is really that. It's a consolidation loan that's based on cash flow, uh, not based on credit score, not based on traditional debt service metrics. Uh, it's based on a cash flow analysis. And we provide, uh, you know, essentially a consolidation loan. So we pay out those predatory lenders directly. We, we negotiate them directly and pay them out directly. Uh, so the borrower doesn't have to deal with, uh, with that dynamic. Uh, and once those debts are removed, we consolidate them under the, the impact lab. Uh, and it's a, it's a very favorable rate right now. It's prime plus eight, which is about 14 and a half percent roughly which is far lower than, uh, you know, several percentage points lower than even uh, responsible payday loans alternatives, uh, and definitely much lower than what they were traditionally paying. So it results in a drastic increase or drastic decrease in interest expense. And the interesting thing about the pricing structure that we played with is that we have rebatable interest. So for the borrowers that we have in the pilot that have, um, that have done, you know, they made all their payments on time. They've done everything they said they were they were going to do at the end of the term. We actually rebate. Uh, I think we're moving to a plus four uh, rebate structure. So the loan becomes a prime plus four loan uh, if you if you pay on time and, and do everything you say you're going to do. And we see that by and large that that is happening. There's been a, we've been surprised at how often loans are paid out early. You can pay it out early anytime with no fees or anything like that attached. Um, there's no late penalties or additional interest. It's just a straight up prime plus eight loan. You pay out your term, it becomes a prime plus, uh, plus four loan. Uh, and it provides a bit of a cushion on the, on the back end of the term, uh, into a savings account so that the individuals that are participating are less likely to, to be in that situation in future. And for reference, what would be the average kind of payday lending rate just so folks in the audience? Yeah, on an APR basis, it, uh, it depends on the fee, the fee limits in, uh, in each particular province, because um, it's based, it's usually a fee per $100. But if you convert it to an APR rate, it can be as high as four, 547%. Um, so it's, uh, it's quite <laughs> substantial. It's a very, it's like a bomb into people's cash flow, because it's not just the rate, it's the way it's paid. Like you pay it out in its entirety at your next payday is, is how it works, which means, you know, yes, you pay out that loan term, but then you're going to be in need of another one. Uh, I don't know about yep. uh, what, what you and Jonah would say, but I, I would say if I had to hand over my paycheck uh, next time, it would cause an issue <laughs> yeah. to my cash flow. Uh, so, and, and the same is true of our borrowers. Uh, so it's, it's quite cumbersome. It's a very difficult trap to get out of without an influx of cash. Uh, and we wanted to provide a way of, of doing that. Great, thank you. And then maybe, you know, kind of building off that, uh, Wovio was established to solve the access uh, gaps to credit for new immigrants. Can you talk more about your model? Like what does rotating savings look like and how does it bridge this gap? Yeah, so rotating savings from a credit perspective, uh, this is uh, communities pulling their own savings together. Um, so usually how it works is uh, a group of people, socially connected people, they pull funds together and take turns accessing the lump sum. So in turn, from a credit perspective, that, that's a no interest, uh, zero interest loan uh, that users are able to leverage within their community groups. Uh, for us, our basis was actually to reimagine the fundamentals of credit and then how it works uh, as, a, as a basis of building a foundation to access to other financial products. And then uh, for us, how we do it is we partner in. So 
when we when we looked into the segment, a lot of newcomers were practicing this informally, and then they usually had issues with the banks, right, in terms of compliance, AML, and then how these transactions were being facilitated. Uh, so plugging in the payment infrastructure through our partnership with Visa and People's Trust Bank to enable communities to be able to create these groups and then facilitate this transaction has been actually revolutionary uh, for these individuals. Uh, so just to give some insights, we've been running a pilot for the past uh, three to six months. And we have facilitated over a million dollars in transactions with 0% default. Um, and then some of the insights that we are seeing is when people collaborate, you know, people always say don't bring friends and money together. But then there's the elements of social peer pressure, social collateral that we're trying to quantify from a, a credit uh, and a repayment data point uh, as we are reporting these transactions to the credit bureaus to enable them to be able to leverage uh, those things. So from a use case, it's mainly a financial security tool that communities are using to be able to bridge that gap. And it all starts from a credit question of like even myself I ask myself why save with a financial institution that I can't borrow from right it doesn't it doesn't make sense you save with a financial institution you now have an emergency you're trying to borrow money and you're bad from the system you can't access that credit um, so that's why people uh, resolve to these uh, alternatives such as a rotating savings product whereby you're actually leveraging the wealth of the community to be able to bridge those gaps. Um, so that's kind of like our approach. And then for us, we are plugging in into existing communities. Uh, so from colleges to community associations, plugging into those existing communities, being able to bring people together, uh, pull funds together and enable them to utilize those same transactions as a way to build credit history. Because each payment that you're making is helping you build credit history whilst also you're accessing those no interest loan uh, through that process. Yeah, it reminds me, as you were speaking, it reminds me of um, this now, it's, I'm dating myself, but it was 2008 when I started working on building this, micro, or sorry, 2010 when I started to build this micro fund and evaluating the differences between international spaces and, and a more kind of Canadian, US-based space and kind of this idea of community was different. Like we have such an individualistic society, but I think you've tapped into kind of a community with the new immigrants, like the, the, the strategic focus on new immigrants where community does matter. And that mm -hmm. social pressure um, is a critical component, I imagine, of, of the repayment. Exactly, yeah. Um, okay, so now you know, we hear often um, about the cost of the impact work, right? So, um, you know, you know, one thing that we're well aware of and, and through our work in New Power Labs, that a lot of these investments, so the investments uh, actually create tremendous amount of value and benefits. Um, so, you know, often when financial institutions, when you know, organizations are building new products and new companies like you, Jonah, um, you know, there's a view of serving the underserved is expensive. Um, so I want to kind of flip that conversation and perhaps uh, for both uh, you and Keith, but can you talk and maybe we'll start off with Keith about the impacts that you've seen as a result of the escalator loan, both economically and socially. Sure. I, um, yeah, I think it's a great, it's a great question. It's a, it's a great point. It's been kind of a missing piece in the whole uh, purpose movement in financial services is, is that part of the picture where you are able to articulate what value you create for everybody else. Uh, you know, financial students have a great platform for, for impact. Only looking at the value they create for themselves misses a huge chunk of the, the picture. And I think if you have that pit part of the picture, you can make different decisions. Uh, you can prioritize things differently. Um, so it's been an area of, uh, it's been an area of focus uh, for the pilot because we realized pretty early on in the escalator loan pilot in particular that we were creating a lot of non-financial value for people and, and it was significant. Uh, so we were having the expected income or the expected impacts on people's financial health. We, we were removing a significant debt, debt expense and or interest expense and replacing it with a much more palatable one. Um, so we were reducing interest expense. We were seeing some savings activity happening where you know there was no savings activity happening before. Uh, but then there was these, we we're seeing some improvements in credit scores. Like there was a number of financial, you know, credit worthiness type impacts that we were seeing. And that's what we expected. What we weren't entirely sure we would see, uh, it was, you know, the degree to which it impacts non-financial outcomes. So what we noticed early on was that it was having significant impact on mental health, on some pretty, um, you know, we were seeing uh, mental health, we were seeing 
impacts on access to physical health service like dentistry and prescription drugs and things that aren't generally covered by government uh, healthcare programs. Uh, we were seeing food security changes in food security and housing security uh, and in opportunities for the children of the borrowers. Like there was a number of well-being focused um, non-financial impacts that we started to become really interested in. Uh, and we ended up uh, doing an initial social return on investment analysis because we wanted some way of kind of rolling this up in a uh, in a way that's easy to understand and kind of see the values created, like the value created uh, from the non-financial side of the ledger uh, as a way of kind of having an interesting kind of dashboard for how our, our, our programs are going. And it's been, it's been useful. We've worked with Social Value Canada and with uh, Symmetrica Jacobs, which is a company in the, in the UK to help value some of those changes to, um, to the well-being of the borrowers. And it's, it is a work in progress, we're going to share some of that work um, uh, kind of later this year and as time goes along uh, and in the hopes that others will engage in that sort of analysis with us. I think we're producing a lot of uh, a really interesting, you know, financial proxies and outcomes that can be used. And, um, you know, there's an opportunity for financial institutions to really look at this as part of a broader ESG strategy, in my opinion. It's, it's kind of a, a way of articulating value, not just measuring risk. Uh, and that and that's really really interesting, uh, and it moves beyond just kind of risk management to actual decision making and prioritization that goes on in uh, in strategy formation. So it's got a really interesting role to play. But that's uh, that's that that's what we've done uh, so far. And what we're seeing is for every dollar of cost that we incur, so you know, cost to administer uh, any loan losses, and for every dollar that we incur in cost, we're seeing uh, about twelve dollars back in social non-financial value created. So uh, it's it's bearing fruit. I think as we build out parts of that framework, we'll, we'll see an even higher ratio, but uh, it's, been, it's been really eye-opening. And who are the main beneficiaries of the escalator loan now, demographic-wise, class-wise? Like, do you have information that you can share on yeah. that? So the primary uh, credit demographic is, you know, a below 600 score. Uh, so typically not able to qualify for, especially unsecured lending in a mainstream financial institution. Uh, so lower credit scores, lower incomes. Um, we're seeing anecdotally, you know, a lot of uptake from women. Uh, let's say the majority of the the profile, uh, majority of the borrow profile. I think it's like 70 percent. Uh, has been uh, has been women, uh, which is not something we designed it. For, you know, it's not a it's not a segment we designed for, but it's that's that's who's taken us up on it. Uh, and in particular, in the last year or so, we've especially noticed uh, you know uh, a, a strong uptake from from BIPOC women, uh, which I think says a lot about you know where they see how they see access to mainstream uh, financial services. So I, I think those are the most interesting insights uh, we have is there's definitely trends that we're interested in um, unpacking some more and understanding better. And I think we're looking at the social well-being and valuation measurement work as a, as a way of kind of building in that stakeholder value perspective to understand that better. Great. Thank you. Um, and Jonas, you know, since 2021, can you share more about the impacts you've seen as a result of Wopio? And you are also a company that has been invested in through venture capital. So, you know, you're playing in this kind of slightly different space. So I'd love to kind of understand your thoughts on this. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very interesting uh, experiment uh, between impact and uh, combining it with the VC world. Uh, but then for us, I think it's the effectiveness of the solution. Uh, that's one thing that we're seeing. So for us, three key metrics that we look at is uh, one, we're seeing improvements in savings, improvements in repayment rates, which ends up being improvements in credit scores. There is uh, a certain insight that we're seeing in terms of how social collateral can enable better financial habits that can take these three things from savings, credit to financial security. Uh, and then that's been kind of like a greatest insight to facilitate. Um, so for example, we are seeing international students use our product to be able to build credit in a way that's budget friendly to them. You can easily create a group whereby you're making contributions of $50 with your friends and then be able to build credit in that way. So you're not stuck in a rate race of making minimum payments on uh, on credit cards and then you're kind of trapped in that debt cycle so we're seeing kind of like that uh tap into kind of like the ecosystem of how they use financial products we're also talking to universities uh whereby i think we're talking to one university in calgary and then for them the one number number one issue among international students coming to canada was financial stress 
financial stress was the biggest component around uh, their mental health. And then when you dig deeper, it was around fear of missing out around the social behaviors of young people around like, oh, hey, we are going on a vacation. But then you tell like that peer pressure from all your peers can enable you to make bad, bad spending habits. So by using a product like this, you're seeing them come together and then kind of like reinvent those um, social behaviors, which tie into the financial behaviors mechanism of how they can be able to improve. So it's more, even more psychological in terms of how people um, save. It's also more psychological in terms of how they how they view credit as a tool for financial security. Uh, so those are some of the insights in terms of how we're working. And then we're actually now running a pilot with the, uh, the NRC to be able to develop an alternative credit scoring that's based on this community-based transactions uh, in terms of how do you quantify financial history, but then also how do you combine that with social collateral and then be able to provide as an alternative because if that incentivizes better financial behaviors, how do you quantify that as a, as a credit scoring and a risk management um, tool in terms of credit access? So those are some of the things. Uh, we're still pretty early. So we've done a million transactions with a cohort of a thousand users. We have a, a wait list of about 14,000 users because we're seeing a lot of uptake, especially right now in an economic downturn where there's a credit crunch. People are looking for alternative options to be able to access those services. Uh, so it's a pretty exciting moment of like how community-based solutions can be an alternative and really uh, stand out from the existing uh, banking infrastructure to provide viable and then sustainable solutions to the ecosystem. Great, thank you. And you're both scaling um, products that can have tremendous impact across Canada. You know, I think through, you know, uh, Keith, you touched on you know, the ESG, kind of how financial institutions, credit unions can think about this as part of their ESG work or, um, you know, integrated into their strategy. And, and Jonah, you, you know, as somebody, you know, you've received impact in, in, investing you know this is you know if you are a foundation in the room you know how do you invest your assets and if if you're working on improving access to financial capital through your philanthropy this seems like a very organic way um, for you to do it through your asset base as well through an investment in organizations like yourselves who are trying to tackle this from another angle um, now that said you're both building these products and anything anytime you build you face barriers can you share more about the barriers you faced um in that in in this journey of, of building um i'm sure there were regulatory considerations which made it harder to introduce innovations in the space um you know like these are different types of products so getting people to shift and, and change mindsets um it would be helpful to discuss you know, what these challenges are um, and have been to providing more products um, that can drive access to capital to underfunded communities at scale. Hmm. You wanted to go first, John? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I'm happy happy to. Um, I, uh, it, it's been really tough uh, for us. Um, just one, we are a startup. Um, two, we don't have the brand credibility. Uh, so when we started, it literally took us about 18 months to be able to build the infrastructure. Uh, some of the things that we had to go through to get a bank partnership, you need to have at least a million dollars on your balance sheet. Um, so those are some of the requirements that you need to go through. We needed to build compliance programs in terms of like how this model would work uh, because we had to go through like is it from a core banking infrastructure is it a security or is it a payment how are we facilitating uh, that that process uh, but then for us we leveraged uh, the open banking infrastructure that's now in Canada we are not there in terms of like open banking as a as a policy but the infrastructure with like things such as uh, Plaid and then other tools that you can be able to connect uh, bank accounts to to platforms but then also leveraging the kind of like the 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 innovation uh, that's with, within the space. Um, so for us right now, we are regulated with the uh, FinTrack, but then also kind of like the Retail Payments Act uh, that's just coming out with the Bank of Canada. So we'll be part of uh, part of that regulation. But it was uh, it was really tough from building the infrastructure and then also working with the regulations. But the good thing is for us, we are operating from Alberta, and then Alberta has a fintech sandbox um, ecosystem, whereby if you have a new solution, you're able to plug into that ecosystem in terms of how the solutions can be impactful. So it's a very controlled environment where you're trying to see impact, cost, and then kind of like from a consumer privacy perspective, how do you combine those uh, to be able to provide sustainable solutions um, to, to communities, sustainable solutions to people. Uh, but then, yeah, for us, it's been uh, it's been 18 months building the infrastructure, but then for us, it's a, it's a really a passionate business 
uh, because we are immigrants to Canada, financial security, we faced it from where we are coming from. And you come here to Canada as an immigrant, you still face that issue of financial security. So we're looking at how can we reimagine uh, financial security? How can we reimagine access to credit? And then for us, our firm belief is through decentralization, but then also kind of like understanding how we can use mechanisms such as transparency and uh, collaboration to be able to bridge that gap. Um, so that has been kind of like our journey so far uh, to be able to get to where we are today. And what's been the journey of raising capital as immigrants to be able to build Wovio? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, we had to talk to, so to date, we have talked to 120 investors uh, yeah. to be able to get uh, about five investors that we have now. It was that uh, it was really tough because one thing that I, I've learned uh, through this journey is really finding mission aligned investors. So if someone doesn't resonate with the immigrant immigrant journey, it's harder for them to be able to resonate with the problem and the opportunity that can be uh, that can be an upside to solving that problem. Uh, but then also just tapping into an ecosystem. I came to Canada as an immigrant, so you have to build this business network from scratch, which was really tough. It takes time to be able to build trust. It takes time to be able to build this business relationships. So we had to go through, because we started working on this idea back in 2020. Uh, we started building the infrastructure back in 2021. So how do we get to an MVP whereby we can convince uh, investors that, hey, there's a viable solution that can solve this problem. But then also how do we connect with investors uh, that are patient? I think that was, was one key priority because we are building something that doesn't exist within the North American ecosystem. So it's going to take patience. We don't want people on the team who seek external validation in the early days. It's really about building sustainable solutions that can be innovative and impactful to the people that we're trying to serve. Uh, so that, that has been the experience. But then for us, we as a team, we are really focused on the mission at hand. And then that's kind of been our, our, yeah, our bullseye. Amazing, thank you. I'm gonna do a shameless plug. We have a tool called New Power Match, which is partly trying to address you know, what you described is how do we connect investors, impact investors with mission related opportunities. So uh, we'll put a little link in the, the chat there for anyone who's interested to learn more about that. Um, Keith, what about your end? What have been the barriers? You know, you're operating adjacent to a, a credit union. How yeah. is that happening? Well, the barriers, uh... It was interesting. Like this is very thematic for why we uh, where we decided to structure the impact lab the way we we did, uh, and that really is that financial institutions are not great places to run experiments uh, for for lots of reasons. Um, but you know, a lot of them are are are, are justified. I, I think you're responsible for a really broad swath of, of stakeholder interests there, and ultimately responsible for people's money. So running experiments is uh is something that's done very very cautiously uh but you know that does that does have uh kind of a you know a, a dampening effect on like you know the 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 boldness and uh and number of experiments that you can run so what we wanted to do was take you know recognize that that was the case and create an, an entity that's essentially separate from the financial institutions balance sheet and where you know that stakeholder interest is kind of compartmentalized and protected, uh, and use that entity to run more experiments. Um, and that's the structure. Like that's why we structured the Impact Lab the way it is. So you can kind of take the experiments out of the institution, run them to a point where you you can meet all the institution's risk criteria and understand how these things work, and then eventually bring them back. Uh, so we actually took took the experiments out of the institution uh, so that we can understand how to bring them back into the institution. Uh, this, the, the barrier I would say to that approach now is that, you know, we've arrived at, I think at the right st structure, uh, the barrier and it's unique. I'm not sure of another one like it in, in Canada. I think there's similar models elsewhere in the world, but I haven't seen one in Canada. Uh, the barrier just to work at this point and the number of experiments we can run is really just, uh, scale, uh, and, and the funding pool. Uh, we have kind of the funding, is, you know, comes primarily from the credit union now, um, and there's a long list of experiments we we could run. I think we're in the midst of kind of figuring out how to capitalize, uh, like to bring some capital behind some of those opportunities, uh, and how to engage with the fintech sector a little bit uh, more strategically. They've always been part of, you know, the 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 experiments we've been running, uh, you know, where they usually have started with a fintech partner at, at some point in the evolution, but, you know, how to, in, how to engage with that community. I saw a question in the, the chat about, you know, whether we work with startups. 
I think we do, but in a bit, like as partners in, in the in experiments, we want to uh, create a vehicle for startups to participate in the impact lab more actively. So we don't do things like incubation uh, or or things at that stage yet, uh, but we'll be, you know, I think interested in doing so in future. So I don't know, that's a rambling answer in some ways, but uh, that's where we're at. Thank you, no, really helpful. Um, thank you both uh, for, for uh, being with us today and going through the details of, of how you, you are addressing in different ways, um, access to capital to underbanked and, and trying to solve for the, the volume of predatory options that exist. Uh, we are gonna open it up and my apologies, we ran a little late to questions. <laughs> Um, uh, I know there was uh, two from Louise earlier in the conversation, um, and there's one around when we, like, it was when we were talking about, I believe, access to capital for Black business owners um, and how that was translating to kind of personal financial supports and outcomes. Um, a question that she has is, how do we see kind of what we're talking about here play out in the personal lives as well as business and entrepreneurial aspirations. So the limitations to access to capital, I think. Um, how do we see that playing out then um, in the personal lives and aspirations to these communities that are underbaked? Yeah, I, I always think about the broad. Is that a question for me? <laughs> well, right. either or, either or, and 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 uh, Louisa, if you want to, if I've articulated the essence of the question, okay, great. <laughs> um, for either of you. Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, what what the um, what the focus on measuring well being has kind of opened up for us is is just the ways in which banking creates value or uh, detracts from value created, uh, depending on how it's uh, how it's applied. So when it's applied in the right way, you can create uh, you know create some really significant value for people in different non-financial aspects of, of their lives. So you know I, I don't know if I can answer the question really specifically, but at like a really high level, you know, building on that sort of approach in banking is a, is a way of kind of changing conversations that go on in boardrooms and how prioritize and how different sorts of initiatives and uh, innovations are prioritized. I think to solve for that access issue, it requires innovation, uh, but in order to facilitate that innovation, it, it needs to be based on actual experience. So you need to create vehicles for the actual experience of addressing those needs and, and doing that type of lending. Uh, and showing how it can work and showing what the risk profile is. I, I think that's how you kind of bring that, um, you know, potential to bear within the balance sheets of institutions. Uh, but it's hard to make that leap without that bridge innovation approach. Right. And Jonah, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, so for me, I think uh, our credit scoring system is a bit uh, flawed. Um, so it's really hard to be able to expand access to credit using kind of like the, the legacy and traditional systems. Uh, that's why I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, community banks because they are more aligned with uh, the community. So I, I, for me, I believe like decentralization sometimes can be the answer because you have these communities that have assets. Um, can you enable them to be able to leverage those assets in a way that provides access to affordable capital? But then right now with the existing infrastructure, a lot of people, especially within uh, BIPOC communities, they're starting off probably that the first credit card that you have is a 20 something plus percentage. So you're starting off from like a bad financial product that you're using to be able to build your financial future. And by the time you establish a business, by the time you want to go to college, whatever that requires credit, really you're kind of like in that subprime um, component and then which makes credit more expensive. Uh, so how do we reimagine? How do we evaluate risk? For me, I think the best way to solve access to credit is to actually solve for the risk modeling component. And then that's kind of like one thing that we're looking to be able to experiment and find more insights. Yeah. yeah I, can I? Yeah. That was, a, that was a great point, Jonah. I, and I would say, the only thing I would add to it is um, like credit unions, the credit union structure is cooperatively owned. And I think that's misunderstood in different parts of Canada. Uh, the value of that is, is kind of 
it has some interesting potential. Uh, like it's really the only type of banking structure you have where you can you know join as a customer of a bank and actually be a shareholder of the bank as well. Uh, which means you can vote in AGMs, you can vote for who's on the board, you you have a say in how the place is run, um, which is different than, you know, a shareholder owned bank. Uh, so if I had to just kind of get my last two cents in there, I would say, you know, join a credit, not only don't just join a credit union, but participate in the governance process and and vote for directors and run and, and run for those seats it's it's a it is a democratic process and it has some really interesting potential from an underrepresented group uh, perspective amazing thank you both i wish we had more time to continue this conversation uh, i want to i want to just take a moment to thank again keith jonah for joining us a few takeaways um, um you know from this conversation so one is banking is like healthcare and could be profoundly impactful in our prosperity as individuals and as a community. Newcomers, other underfunded communities are missing out on uh, most of most on the quality of banking. Um, you know, there's a piece of trust. Um, they don't have access to current banking systems due to credit history and the lack thereof. There's a lot of opportunities here. I remember when I was building Rise. Um, again, it was for a segment of uh, community that was under under. Funded uh, people with a history of mental health and addiction challenges, and um, it was about giving them either part-time or full-time employment. And what we found was, uh, what we know is that work is a social determinant of health and a predictor of recovery. And so, the more we could get individuals even doing part-time or full-time work, the more helpful it was in these other aspects of life. Um, and another takeaway from this conversation is, you know, to solve these big gaps we see in underfunded communities. Uh, we need to be more creative and proactive to build products that are accessible and culturally relevant to underserved communities. I um, mean, these can be challenging, you know, but how do we work together? How do we get more capital into these new types of innovation and create the right supportive ecosystem to drive this work? Um, and, you know, I think what Bill mentioned, Alberta's FinTech Sandbox ecosystem, and there's a lot of different elements um, there, including if you're a foundation and you care about this work, how do you start engaging in impact investing in organizations like Wovia, which is raising? So reach out to Jonah if you are interested. Um, another kind of final takeaway is that I think both Wovia and Duca have not only seen positive economic impacts, um, but also social impacts to their customers. So their products have allowed borrowers to pay off debt while saving and moving out of the debt cycle, improve credit scores, access to healthcare services not covered by health insurance, improving food security, housing security, and ultimately building, I think, what we all care about, a more prosperous Canada um, at, a, at, a, at a local level and at a national level. Um, so we do have a quick poll. We hope everyone can fill out the poll for feedback. We always want to hear what you have to say um, uh, as part of our kind of monthly New Power Talk series. Again, thank you, Jonah. Thank you, Keith. Thank you to the back end, Han, Tracy, and team uh, at New Power Labs for, for driving this event today. And thank you all for joining us.